This program does not provide medical advice. We assume no liability for the information provided on MindForce Radio. Please consult your physician before beginning any exercise or nutrition program. Hey, Bob, thanks for having me on the show. My name is David Wright from Green Coast Springs, Florida. Uh, I first uh, worked with Bob when I was working in Baghdad, Iraq, during the height of the Iraq War, uh, and I had a telephone consultation with Bob at webstringcoach.com while I was on leave. Bob was very thorough and well-planned. We came up with a program for me that that I could adjust it as needed, given the equipment available and often less than desirable locations. I wasn't new to strength training, but Bob cleared up many things for me in his approaches I still use. I worked up to 20 reps with 305 under his instruction and added 15 solid pounds of muscle in about eight weeks. If you need an honest strength coach who is the real deal, contact Bob at webstrengthcoach.com. From Mind Force Radio, this is Natural Strength Night with Maximum Bob. On Natural Strength Night, we don't talk about the other things Bob likes to talk about. Tonight, we only talk strength training. When I say strength training, I don't mean training like punk-ass goons in the muscle magazines who jacked up on juice, steroids, and PEDs. I mean natural strength. Strength built on good food, heavy weights, and no shortcuts. If you want to learn about real natural strength, weight training the right way, the old school way, stick around. Bob and his friends just might teach you something. He's here, the host of Natural Strength Night, Maximum Bob Whalen. Tonight, it's an honor for me to have as our guest, Stuart McRobert. I've known Stuart for over 20 years. I consider him to be my strongest ally in the promotion of good, honest training information. The one word that best describes Stuart is integrity. Stuart is one of the few out there with enough guts to take a real stand against the use of PEDs in strength training. You will never see Stuart compromised by using the drugged up stars to sell his products like most others do. You won't see their pictures on his website or books either. I admire him for that. I'm proud to say I wrote for Stuart's great magazine, Hard Gainer, for a 10-year span from 1994 to when the magazine ended in 2004. I owe a lot to Stuart for giving me my start in writing and getting me established. Stuart saved the modern physical culture movement, in my opinion. I remember those dark days after Perry Rader sold Iron Man way back in 1986. I was working as a federal agent at the time, even before I was transferred to Washington, D.C., and way before I started whale and strength training. There was nothing new that was good to read. All the magazines were crap. The new Iron Man was swiftly ruined by the new ownership after 1986. They turned that great magazine into another muscle and fiction drug rag. I ended my subscription. Along came Hardgainer in 1989. What a breath of fresh air. What a godsend. It was an honest magazine for the drug-free trainee whose message was strongly against the use of drugs. No BS advertising, truthful information for the genetically typical and even the genetically disadvantaged. Hard Gainer turned out to be even better than Iron Man, in my opinion. Even Perry Rader compromised with the top drug stars and had a place for them in his magazine. Stewart never did. I consider Hard Gainer to be the best magazine in the history of physical culture. It came at just the right time and was so needed. Stewart has published many great books and has written hundreds of great articles. My favorite book is his original Brawn. It is still the first book I recommend to my clients. The good news is Hard Gainer magazine is now being digitized under the title of Bodybuilding Goldmine. 
The first two volumes of Bodybuilding Goldmine are now available in Kindle format from Amazon.com. Check out all of Stuart's great books and get Bodybuilding Goldmine at Hardgainer.com. And Stuart, welcome to Natural Strength Night. Hey, Bob. Thank you for having me. Stuart, tell us why the training routines in the mainstream muscle magazines are worthless to the average drug-free trainee. Well, generally, the uh, the mantra from the mainstream muscle mags is uh, train like a champion to become a champion yourself. But the only guys who do really well on that sort of training are the ones that have exceptional genetics for bodybuilding and they also have drug assistance. Uh, so guys, on, uh, guys who are drug-free and with just average or normal genetics they can't do well on those routines. Um, so, so follow the routines of those guys with genetic advantages and drug assistance that the average guy doesn't have is a total waste of time. Um, now, average genetics and sufficient drugs, I mean, some, I mean, most guys don't have terrific genetics like the pros do, but some guys with average genetics and sufficient drugs, they can do reasonably well on the champions' routines, but not to the level of the really monster bodybuilders. Uh, this, of course, assumes that the guys on the drugs don't uh, wreck their health in the meantime on the way to the progress that they want to have. So, what works for the drug-free guys with normal genetics is very different in fact, it's in a completely different world to what works for the guys on drugs and with great genetics. Um, so, because the, uh, the champions' routines don't work for the, uh, the normal guys, this uh, yields lots of frustration and disappointment, which actually uh, helps in the sale of bodybuilding food supplements. Um, because the routines don't work, then the sales pitches for bodybuilding supplements sound very attractive because they offer supposedly the key to training progress. Uh, but in reality, even with the food supplements, those routines of the champions still don't work for drug-free, genetically normal guys. And another thing with this, uh, following the, the routines of the so-called champions, I mean, when I say champions, I mean, that uh, should be an inverted commas because guys that are stuffed with drugs and all the rest of it are not really champions. But just for the sake of the, the argument, we'll use champions uh, with inverted commas. Now, uh, following the, um, the routines of the champions actually encourages drug use itself because... Uh, only with the drugs do those routines work really well. So many guys over the years, and I mean many guys, have found their fix to their training problem just simply by taking bodybuilding drugs. And then almost any training routine will yield progress, perhaps terrific progress, uh, if enough drugs are taken and if the guys don't wreck their health in the meantime. For building muscle and strength is in a different world, a different solar system, in fact, to what works for the guy right. on drugs and with great genetics. So, just forget right. about the routines of the guys in those magazines, the bodybuilding champions' routines, but their routines <laughs> for the normal guy are utter, utter BS. <laughs> like what, what I like to say is they're. <laughs> A complete different species than us. I mean, we we don't do the same activity, right? Yeah, yeah. It's different species over here. Yeah. I, I like to make the comparison between um, if you consider a Ferrari uh, Formula One racing car, uh, the manual for that thing doesn't work for a domestic hatchback okay so 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 there is a difference i mean don't use ferrari instruction for your normal family car it just doesn't you know it doesn't apply that's right and one of the main problems is the recovery part because the average person training cannot possibly recover 
in a five and six day routine and even many can't recover on a four day split routine for sure some can't even progress on a three day uh, routine so that is why generally speaking okay it is possible to make a three day program work provided it's uh, really carefully designed and the individual's recovery is you know, better than average but generally speaking most of the time i recommend two workouts a week because that is a good baseline for most people to fall into that gives them five days recovery two days for workouts and you really have a good chance of getting somewhere and Stuart what is your definition of high intensity training or HIT? are you an advocate of HIT? well to me high intensity training uh, means hard work in good exercise technique and building strength it's not merely training as hard as possible. Uh, some people in the, uh, the hit camp, they overdo the intensity and they don't give enough attention to the other stuff. So hard work is essential, imperative actually, but it's just a part of the overall package that's required. Now, for example, it's possible to train very hard yet still not make much progress. It depends on how the effort is carried out, what routines uh, the effort is applied to, whether sufficient focus is given to building strength, and whether sufficient attention is given to the factors of recovery between workouts. Uh, in short, I'm, uh, I advocate simple workouts, each composed primarily, if not exclusively, of just a handful of the big compound exercises together with correct exercise technique, hard work, sometimes extremely hard work, sufficient attention to recuperation between workouts, and building strength. That is the package. And together with that package, you've got to keep accurate workout records. You've got to track what you're doing. Uh, if you're not logging gradually uh, ever increasing exercise poundages, you're doing something wrong and you've got to make changes to your training and your recovery until you are recording strength gains in your log. Now, labels such as uh, high-intensity training, um, they're interpreted differently by different people. So I, I think they need to be clarified in order to avoid confusion. So I I'm not very keen, not, not really keen at all on sort of catchy labels because they can cause a lot of confusion. We've jumped, re we've jumped immediately into the training stuff. I, I want to make very clear um, that the starting point for bodybuilding and lifting success is desire. Without that in abundance and the willingness to train hard on the best exercises, which of course means that you've got to tolerate some dis discomfort, I mean some considerable discomfort of the right kind of course, I'm not talking about pain, I mean, I've known many guys over the years. I mean, they're, they're encyclopedias of what they should be doing, but they don't <laughs> have the desire to train. So all the knowledge, even if it's good knowledge, and some of these guys, they know what to do, but they never do it on a consistent basis because they don't have the desire. So we've got to start with the desire. And if someone has that almost at times, almost, a madness level of desire and passion in the gym. Nothing else matters. You've got to have that desire. That is the desire that will fuel you through your workouts. I used to like the term high intensity training. And now, you know, when people refer to it as this easy label called HIT, you're right. It's getting so confusing. And there's so many different definitions of HIT. One of my biggest problems with it is most of the not all, like you said, not all, but most of the advocates of HIT rarely mention poundage progression. You know, if you if you just go to failure all the time and you're rolling on the ground and going to failure and you don't keep track of increasing your poundages, it's not really doing much good as far as strength gains are concerned. Right, right. Uh, another thing, Bob, here, now, now this only applies to... A minority actually it applies to those that have the desire of the extreme level it is actually possible to train so hard that you actually overdo it 
I mean, I, I can remember as a youngster, this was during the, um, when Arthur Jones and Mike Mentor were uh, writing uh, a great deal. And uh, the, you can't train too hard, you can only train too long, was a mantra for a while. And I remember I lived this mantra. I was at college at the time. And so my, uh, my recovery was good. I used to sleep a lot. I used to eat a lot. I mean, the recovery was fine. But in the gym, I used to crucify myself, well, almost crucify myself. I used to annihilate myself, not just training to momentary failure, but then going beyond that with assisted reps, and then beyond that with uh, negative reps. I mean, I crucified myself in the gym. And despite my recovery, and I think I was only training twice a week, despite that uh, uh, leisurely life that I had, I had at the time at college, I made no progress. It wasn't that I wasn't trying to increase my strength. My body wouldn't respond to the training. And the, the load from the, the super duper high intensity was so much that my body was pounding into oblivion and it wasn't capable of responding. So that was an extreme case, but it happened. So even high intensity training has to be clarified because you really can overdo it. It's unusual, it's rare. I mean, I hardly ever see anyone in the gym overdoing intensity. I see nearly everyone overdoing everything else, but not overdoing effort. But just know that it is possible for those guys who have the desire that I talked about in such, to such a level that they overdo things. Yeah, I agree. Because sometimes they put effort way over poundage progression. But do you think that going to muscular failure is the best way to train, or is it just a more time-efficient way to train? Uh, going to muscular failure is one option, of course. Uh, and done properly, it works. And uh, as you say, it's a very time-efficient way to train. But if it's done at the expense of correct exercise technique in the major exercises like squats, deadlifts, presses, benches, it really can be ruinous, ruinous. Uh, that's point one. And secondly, um, the uh, training to muscular failure is it, it's an extremely intense way of training. It requires a very high level of motivation. Uh, it's best done when supervised by a competent coach to ensure that technique doesn't degrade and become um, you know, harmful. But uh, it's essential to yep. train hard, but not necessarily mm -hmm. muscular failure. So what I call right. regular hard training, which is where you stop at the, the final full rep that you can just squeeze out, that regular hard training can also be very effective. Uh, and I would say that that is a better mainstay type of training for most people for most of the time because it's more doable and arguably safer than continuing on to the point where the bar can't be budged and your form degrades, if not uh, gets wrecked completely, and you can actually do some trouble. Um, and as noted in the previous answer, intensive training and correct exercise technique is just part of the package. Like in my example from when I was in college, uh, it has to be applied to a good routine and sufficient attention must be given to recuperation between workouts and there must be constant striving to build strength. If you think you're doing everything correctly, but your training log isn't um, showing you that you're actually increasing in strength, then obviously something is wrong. You're either not training hard enough or in a very, very few cases you could be training hard, too hard, but uh, the cases of people training too hard are so rare that I think perhaps we should, we should forget about that possibility. First, you have to learn what correct exercise technique is. I don't know how many times people in the gym have said, but I use proper form. And then they show me what they think proper form is. And, you know, I always want to pull my hair out. They think that's proper form. <laughs> sometimes sometimes right. what they, uh, they do, especially in you know, the, uh, the squat, the deadlift, the bench, the overhead press and the row, especially in those exercises, what, me, what people think is decent form or even mediocre form is, is horrendous. Only when you can apply correct exercise technique 
do you start to train hard? No one should train hard unless they really know what correct exercise technique is. Uh, so once you're applying correct exercise technique, and of course you don't jump into training and uh, flat out right from the beginning. You, you know, you ease in over a few weeks, you build up gradually, let your body adjust, and then you start to give your pound of flesh in the gym. Uh, I recommend that everyone forgets about uh, trying to train, about uh, training too hard. I mean, so few people train too hard, it's best that they just forget about that possibility. Nearly everyone in the gym that I see needs to crank up their effort. I hardly ever see anyone right. that I say, hey, you, you better back off one rep there because I think you're taking it a bit too far. Although there are some guys that like to keep doing assisted reps. I don't know what it is about some people that do the bench press and they have to have someone there sort of pulling the last five reps for them. And sometimes it's the guy doing the assisting that seems to end up doing more of the work than the guy on the bench. So I'm not keen on assisted reps because, right. because the guy assisting ends up doing too much of the work. The guy anyway, assisting is so, doing deadlifts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes I look at them doing their sort of semi deadlifts and I'm thinking, Jesus, man, you're going to injure yourself because their form assisting the guy in the bench press is a shamble. <laughs> anyway, but, but that's another story. Yeah. Take it easy on your off days. Sleep eight or more hours a day. Try to have good quality sleep. Eat as much food as you can without getting fat. And that will give you a good chance to recover. Then when you're back in the gym, you should be ready for another hard bout. You should have the capacity to just nudge up some of your exercise poundage is just a little bit and log some progress in your training diary and then you've taken another little step forward and then you do the same again next week and the week after and the week after and you plug away and if you're making a little, pro little bit of progress every week two or three you add that up over the months and the years and that becomes huge but you've got to be making a little bit of progress each week or two. Otherwise, you're just going to tread water. And when you're treading water, you've got to look at everything you're doing in the gym and out of the gym, uh, be very analytical, be very objective, and be very critical, and find out what you're not delivering on. Because continuing with what isn't working isn't going to start working it will just continue not to work. So if you want something to start working, you've got to make a change somewhere. So look at what you're doing and how you're doing it in the gym and look at how you are recovering out of the gym. Stuart, uh, speaking of your um, exercise technique, could you give us your thoughts on what you recommend for uh, concentric and eccentric speed of motion? Well, I don't like people to count seconds while they're training. I want people to concentrate on what they're lifting. But essentially, you lower the weight and you lift it. You don't drop it and you don't heave it. And for most exercises, uh, the, the, perhaps the best single fix for technique for most people, most of the time, for most exercises, is to pause at both ends of the exercise. So, for example, in a deadlift, and this is why it's called a dead lift, is that you lift a dead weight from the deck. So, on the deck, that weight is dead. Okay, just for a couple of seconds, but it's dead. And you stand with the weight, and at the top, you pause for another couple of seconds, and you lower the weight, you don't drop it, you lower the weight to the deck, you put it down gently. Imagine that you're putting the barbell down onto... Um, uh, onto a, like a, a bag of eggs. Imagine that you have to lower the bar and just touch the eggs without breaking any eggs. So th th that's um, uh, something I like to keep in mind just to get people to touch the weight down at the bottom rather than drop it. So I like to see people, all right, the squat is an exception. If you're doing the regular squat, uh, it can be a, not a good idea to actually pause at the bottom unless you're doing it in a rack and you have some support and whatnot. But with most exercises, including the bench press, especially the bench press actually, 
you lower the bar, you pause it on the sec, I mean, in your chest for, say, 1,000, 2,000, something like that, for at least one second, preferably two, pause it, and you push up. Pause at the top and lower. And just that pause at the top and pause at the bottom is enough for most people to fix their technique. Assuming, of course, that they have the right setup for exercises to begin with. I mean, an exercise like the bench press, squat, deadlift, parallel grip deadlift. For those exercises, I mean, your setup really has to be correct to begin with, and it's it's not as um, it's much more complicated than, for example, a barbell curl. I mean, a barbell curl, okay, you can go wrong with a setup, but there's a much lesser room for setup errors with a barbell curl than there is with the big compound exercises. So, you need to know what the right setup is. And then perform your reps carefully with a pause at the top and the bottom. I couldn't agree more. That's exactly the way I do it. I pause on both sides exactly the way you said. It's exactly how I do it. How would you describe your philosophy? Are you more of an effort guy or a, a poundage progression guy? Which, which is more important to you? I know they're both important. I, I'm a progression guy because uh, progression is the name of the game, but sufficient effort is an essential part of producing the progression. But if you have to train uh, at a much higher level to stimulate your body to be able to progress in strength and muscle, then then so be it. So it's up to the individual. And uh, there's also some uh, interplay with, with, with volume as well. You know, you, you can perhaps argue that, say, three work sets, three work sets of the regular hard level can be as effective as one single work set where you go absolutely, you know, a death march type set. Uh, mm-hmm. But for most people, the death march type set is uh, is not doable for most people on a regular basis. But that sort of two or three work sets per exercise of uh, the regular level of sort of intensity, that's the way to go, I think, for, for most people. If I have to boil it down to a nutshell, I'm a, I'm a poundage progression guy more than an effort guy. Uh, there is a very macho side of, of young men who have a huge desire to compete in physical activities. Uh, this applies in the sporting world, uh, on the football pitch and, and so on, where some guys do some things that are almost suicidal for their, for their health. It's like almost, I would think, uh, like being on a, a military battlefield. Some people sort of uh, flip a switch and they go into like a, a suicide mode. And some people can do that in the gym with this intensity thing. They get so wrapped up in the intensity, and I, and I did myself in the past, that the intensity thing becomes their, their reason for being in the gym. And they want to commit to the set to such an extent that they are literally on the deck at the end. And to get to that level, even if they end up injuring themselves, seems to be more important in the moment than actually making progress over the medium and long term. So I want, especially the young guys who are listening to this, just to keep that in mind, that the name of the game is progress over the medium and the long term. To make progress, you have to train safely. You do have to train hard, perhaps very hard, but you don't have to get so carried away with the intensity thing that you make that the be all and end all and forget that the intensity is merely um, the instrument that you use to trigger off a change in your body that will yield the strength and the growth that you're after. So keep the intensity thing in perspective. It's vitally important, but it's not the whole thing. That makes sense, right. Bob? Yeah, to me, intensity includes poundage progression. Lots of people lose focus because they put too much emphasis on going to failure or the the effort of the set rather than the poundage progression part. So I, I agree with you there. As long as you focus on the, the, the most important thing is trying to make progress 
on the poundage, just like you said. And it doesn't mean you're always going to do it because some people get confused about that and they think they're failing because they can't add weight. Because you can't always add weight, but as long as you're trying to, that's the key. That's right. That's right. A lot depends on your stage of training. We'll be back with more right after this. This segment brought to you by VitalNutritionStore.com. Did you know that more than 7 million Americans suffer from coronary heart disease, the most common form of heart disease? Regardless of your age or condition, adding Cardio for Life to your daily regime will dramatically improve your cardiovascular condition. Cardio for Life has been the top-selling Enlarger 9 product in the marketplace now for more than three years. It is also the top-selling product at VitalNutritionStore.com. Formulated by Dr. Harry Elwart, the best-selling author of Let's Stop the Number One Killer of Americans Today, Dr. Harry believes together we can prevent and reverse heart disease. Cardio for Life comes in three wonderful flavors, orange, peach, and grape, and is gluten-free, sugar-free, and sodium-free. Please see our complete line of natural products at vitalnutritionstore.com. That's V-I-T-A-L nutritionstore.com. Randy Roach shocked the world with the release of his first volume of Muscle Smoke and Mirrors several years ago. It was a masterpiece of over 500 pages with such in-depth research and detail that it was not only surprising, but shocking and mind-blowing. It was truly one of the best Iron Game history books ever written. He followed that with Volume 2, another epic book with over 700 pages of equal depth and detail. All serious Iron Game fans need to have these books. Please visit Randy's website at randyroach.ca. That's R-A-N-D-Y-R-O-A-C-H dot C-A. Listen to how Iron Game legend and the Iron Master editor, Osmo Kihaw, describes the book Supernatural Strength. Have you ever wondered how much real-world experience authors have when they write books about weight training? Who is that person behind the computer? What do they really know about the Iron Game? If you picked up this book, Supernatural Strength, you have definitely come to the right place. The author, Bob Whalen, has spent several decades in the Iron Game trenches training himself, competing and coaching in powerlifting, earning academic credentials too numerous to mention, and thousands of hours of training and instructing athletes and trainees of all levels at his Washington, D.C. gym since 1990. He's not only devoted his life to motivating and pushing people to heights they have never been to, but elevating the trainees' understanding why certain methods work better than others. Bob is one of the most respected and revered trainers in the business today. This book is sure to surprise and amaze you at the same time. Order now at SupernaturalStrength.com. That's SupernaturalStrength.com. Don't you think it would be so much easier getting into shape if you had a personal coach? Just like all the celebrities do. Well, now you can. Bob Whalen of WebStrengthCoach.com wants to get you out of your rut and coach you to success. He's dedicated to helping you achieve your strength and fitness goals through your hard work and his expert guidance. Bob will help you with strength training, muscle building, fitness, nutrition, and motivation. He'll make sure you achieve your maximum physical potential. You can get one-on-one training with Bob through his website webstrengthcoach.com he will develop a personalized program tailored to your individual needs a program right for you bob will give you feedback after every workout this is old school fitness and nutrition no fads and no gimmicks bob will use proven natural techniques to make sure you are satisfied so visit webstrengthcoach.com today and let bob help you reach your best self webstrengthcoach.com Do you enjoy history without social engineering? Reading about our founding fathers? Economics from a capitalist perspective? Wisdom from modern patriots? Welcome to UncleSamBooks.com, where virtues like rugged individualism, hard work, and the American dream dominate. UncleSamBooks.com. Great books for homeschooling. UncleSamBooks.com. If you want to become as strong and muscular as possible with health in mind and without lowering yourself to using steroids, the best advice can be found in the classic strongman books of long ago. These are the best books ever written on the subjects of strength training, weightlifting, strongman training, iron game history, and old-time physical culture. 
Many of them can still be found at physicalculturebooks.com. There you will find good, honest, time-tested wisdom from the great old-time strongmen to maximize your natural muscular and strength potential. Please visit physicalculturebooks.com. Listen to Ken Manny, head strength and conditioning coach at Michigan State University, describe the book Iron Nation, a masterpiece text on some of the most intriguing and compelling personal stories, iron game history, and gut-wrenching training routines ever put to paper. If you truly love hard training without all the frills of pomp and circumstance so common today, you will love Iron Nation. Written by lifters for lifters. If you love weight training, you will love Iron Nation. Order now at ironnation.com. That's I R O N nation.com. If you would like to promote your business on Mindforce Radio, we would love to hear from you. Please let us know if you are interested in a 30 or 60 second voice commercial or a banner website ad. Please contact Bob using the contact information provided on mindforceradio.com. You're listening to Natural Strength Night on Mind Force Radio. For someone in their first year or three year of exercise, provided that they are trained correctly, it is possible to make an almost uh, linear progress over that uh, early time. Um, you can almost you can make progress every sort of week or two for several years if you are trained correctly. But at a later date, um, it becomes harder, of course, and uh, and then you might have to sometimes maybe have three, four, five workouts before you you can see um, uh, some increase in strength. But that's for an advanced guy. Uh, for most people, beginners and intermediates, progress is is much more consistent. And of course, we're talking right. about natural guys. Never mind the guys on drugs. Whole different rules for them. Remember. So anyone who's big already, who is making wonderful progress, well, I'll guarantee what is helping make that wonderful progress. And it's not, um, it's not eggs and toast. <laughs> what is your recommended method for poundage progression? Well, uh, look, a- any method that is effective and safe is, is by me, is, is okay with me. But some methods right. are much more doable than others. I personally, I prefer small weight increases because it's much easier to maintain correct exercise technique and perform all your target reps if you increase an exercise by a mere one pound than if you slap on a pair of five pounders or even if you slap on two, um, two and a half pounders for a five pound jump. With the one pound jump, uh, you may not even feel that you've put a bit of extra weight on the bar. But if you add uh, five pounds, you, you'll feel it. And if you add two, 10 pounds, I mean, 10 pounds can you know, take you from uh, a five rep set down to a, you know, a one or a two rep set because it's just way too much. Now, of course, I'm talking now about um, adding weight when you're at your best current poundages. I'm not talking about if you haven't done the bench press for a couple of months and you're getting back in and you're starting light and you're picking up the poundage again. Of course, during that sort of time, you do pick up the poundage uh, 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 much quicker. But once you're very close to your previous best poundage for a given exercise, I, uh, I like people to get small discs a couple of half pounders or a couple of one pounders for the bigger exercises and just add those to the bar. Um, I mean, uh, and for example, let's say that your, your current best uh, bench press is uh, 250 to five reps. What I would do in that case 
I get the guy to, to stay with that weight until he could get to the point where he could make all five reps with a bit to spare. In fact, he could probably get six if he was to really, you know, really push to the maximum. Now, because he has that bit to spare, then next workout, I'd make him do 251. And then he should stick with that for a couple of workouts, if necessary. Perhaps only one workout will be necessary. But if he needs two or three, that's okay. Until he can get the five reps again with room to spare, so that he could actually get six. And then the next workout, he adds his pound again, and so on. Now, especially if uh, people are using these little discs for the first time, uh, and they may be amazed with just how many months they can keep plugging away with adding one pound after one pound after one pound to the major exercises. You can keep it going for month after month after month. I mean, some people have been doing this for over a year. Just keep nudging up the weights. And okay, one pound doesn't sound much, but when you do it, you know, 20, 30, 40 times, that's serious weight. I used to love your articles back in hard gaining when you wrote about those little discs. Those were classics. Do you know where, where, where can you still get those, Stuart? Is, is there a place now that still sells those? Well, I think if you're, someone does an internet search, I think uh, the last time I did, there were, there were a number of people. I mean, uh, John Shemansky was the, the guy that um, really got into producing uh, small weight plates as a result of uh, promotion in Hard Gainer magazine. And John, of course, is no longer with us. Right. But, um, That's where I got mine. Producing, uh, producing small weight plates. So I think if people hunt around the internet, and um, they'll find the plates. Uh, some of the fancy ones um, are quite costly, but if you if you look around, uh, you can find uh, some more basic and simpler ones. You can even go to a hardware store and, and uh, look for some uh, large washers and uh, and make your own. I mean, you know, if four washers make one pound, then get your four washers, tape them together, and you got a you know a one pound disc. I mean, so if you're creative, you can make your own little discs. Uh, some people over the years, they I know they they've used um, a length of chain. They they've got a they've got some heavy duty chain and they've had it cut in in half pound uh, lengths, and then they just loop over two half pound um, lengths of, uh, of chain at the end of the barbell, just to jam them between the plates, and then they've added a one pound uh, to the barbell. So with a bit of creativity, you can uh, you you can find an alternative to the commercial little plates. If you want me, I mean, there are, there's another way of, uh, of adding poundage without using little plates. Uh, the thing with the little plates is, uh, the little plates are really ideal for uh, guys who have their own home gyms. And of course, those guys will, will get themselves a nice set of little plates. They might get themselves a pair of half pound plates and, uh, and two pairs of, um, you know, of one pound plates. I mean, some guys even get, get uh, take it further and get a pair of quarter pound plates. So for the smaller exercises, they can actually add a half pound at a time. Anyway, uh, for guys who don't have a home gym or don't go to a, a really heavy duty, super serious, specialized strength facility that does have small plates, the people that go to um, a regular commercial gym that doesn't have small plates, uh, they need an alternative. If someone is training at that facility and the smallest increment available is five pounds, that means two, two and a half pounders, uh, the way to progress is like this. Uh, let's say that you have a, a best current bench press of 250 for three work sets of five reps each. Uh, and so you have to take, a, you know, two, three, four minutes rest between sets so that you can get your five reps for each of those sets. So you would stick with your, your three sets of five until you can make the final rep of the third set with a little to spare. You've got to have something to spare on that third set. And then you would add the two, two and a half pounders to just the first work set, which of course is the easiest one of the three. So your first work set is 255, and your second and your third are still at 250. And then, once you can do your first work set with a 255 with a room to spare, you know, you could actually get six reps if you really you know, had a, a gun uh, at your temple. You'll get all six. Mm -hmm. Now, next time, 
you keep your 255 for the first work set and you add the five pounds to the second work set. And you stick with your, your 255, your 255 and your 250 until, if someone wants to get that gun out, stick it at your head, you could get a sixth rep with your second set. When you can do that, next workout, you do the bench press, you make the third set 255. And then you have all three sets of 255, five reps each. Stick with that for you know, two, three workouts, however long you need, until you really, what they, what they say, own that weight. So when you own your three sets of five with 255, and you have a little bit of spare capacity left on your fifth rep, of your third rep, of your third set rather, then you repeat the process again. This time it will be with 260 for your first set, 255, 255 for the other two, and so on. Of course, it takes longer to adapt to a five pound increment than it does to a one pound increment, but that's a good way of doing it. But still, I still prefer in any type of gym actually, that people try to do their best to get hold of some small plates, get the gym management to invest in some, to, to use the small weight increments method. That they're, I used to call them uh, little gems because these little yeah, plates yeah, right, are right, so right. valuable, so precious that they are gems. You use them properly and those little gems will enable you to just keep plugging away at adding weight. A workout after workout, week after week, month after month. That's my uh, first recommendation on the weight increment front. But it takes a bit of uh, effort and creativity uh, by the individual trainee to get a hold of those discs and then use them properly. What motivated you to publish Hard Gainer magazine? Well, I'll, uh, I'll choose my words carefully. Look, it was my frustration and my rage with the inadequacy of the mainstream training magazines at the time. That, that was it. I was so cheesed off with what was on offer that I thought, well, I can't just whinge and whine about it. I want to have a go at actually making a contribution to improving the situation. So with a bit of history as to why I did what I did. So I'll just fill you in with a bit of history first, and then, then you'll see. You see, um, I wrote my first uh, magazine article when I was at college in England, and I had it published by Perry Rader in the June-July 1981 issue of Iron Man magazine. I was just uh, 22 years old at the time. I'd subscribed to Iron Man since the mid-1970s, I started working out about 1973-74, so I started subscribing to Ironman in the mid-70s, and then over, and then after Perry published my first article in 1981, uh, he had the magazine for another five years, uh, because he retired in 86. So over that, uh, that five-year period, I wrote quite a few articles for, for Ironman. I don't know what it was, 25, 30 articles, something like that. So Perry as um, was the single most influential person in my own training knowledge and in my own career in the training world. I mean, Perry, Perry was my godsend in the training world. You see, not only did he influence me greatly regarding how to train, he gave me my start as a writer and he provided an opening for me to become a magazine publisher myself. You see, Perry sold Iron Man in 1986, and then that was the, you know, Perry's Iron Man went, and then it changed format, um, and then I thought, after the magazine went, I thought, well, perhaps there might be an opportunity for me to target the hard gainers, as Perry used to call them, the hard gainers who considered Iron Man, his Iron Man magazine, the only one to include any training instruction that was useful for them. You see, Perry's Iron Man it used to have the uh, the champion stuff. You know, it had stuff on Schwarzenegger and Mentz and all the rest of it. But as well as that, it had stuff written by and for hard gainers. And of course, Perry himself uh, targeted most of his own writing 
at the hard gainers, because he was one himself back in the 30s when he got started, and he became famous for the tremendous um, progress he made after about 10 years of failure and other stuff. Uh, the tremendous progress he made over a year or so on his very abbreviated routine that had as its um, a linchpin the 20 rep squat. He did a 20 rep squat together with a breathing, breathing pullover and together with a pressing motion and together with a, a rowing motion or a chin up motion. Those were the four exercises, just those four. Twice a week for over a year, he transformed himself. And it was because of that success that he was inspired to start the magazine, which led to Ironman magazine. So, roll on 50 years, Perry retired, and I thought, I'm going to have a go at trying to reach those hard gainers that uh, used to read Perry's Ironman for the information that was targeted primarily at them. So, what I had in mind was a magazine that wouldn't mix up you know, the mainstream and the, for, better, a, a want, uh, for a want of a better description, the hard gainer material. I had in mind a magazine that would focus solely 100% on drug-free trainees who are either genetically normal or, in some cases, genetically disadvantaged. Look, the degree of hard gainingness varies from trainee to trainee. Now, it depends on how each person trains and on their genetics. I mean, some people, the way they train, they're going to be a no-gainer because the way they're training yeah, it just doesn't work. But assuming you have a normal genetics and you follow a reasonable hard gainer program, you can make progress. But it has to be a so-called hard gainer program. So I wanted Hard Gainer magazine to focus on hard gainers themselves, of course, providing hard gainer routines. Um, now, the magazine, I had in mind that it would be free of drugs, hype, hyperbole, exaggerated claims, all the deceit and the hokum and BS, as you would call it, that abound in the mainstream of bodybuilding. And uh, it would be completely devoid of instruction that works only for guys on drugs uh, and for those who have uh, exceptional genetics for bodybuilding. But the thing is, the thing is about this so-called hard gainer instruction that I was promoting and still promote now, is that this stuff actually works like gangbusters for guys who have genetics for bodybuilding better than average. I mean, the drug-free guys with genetics better than average. Um, so, the hard gainer routine aren't only for hard gainers. What we call hard gainer routines are actually for everyone who's drug free because they work for all the people who are drug free. Of course, they will also work for the guys who are on drugs, and that's another story. But we are uh, talking about guys who are not on drugs. So, hard gainer routines work for all of them, but some of the hard gainers are legitimately much harder gainers than some of the others because of various structural issues, health problems, age, and whatnot. So some of these hard gainer routines do need to be heavily customized to suit individual very hard gainers. Now, as a bit of an aside here, Bob, um, I remember someone in California telling me, and uh, I think he must have been uh, you know, smiling as he, was, um, as he wrote this, he said in the gym, the gym that he was at, he said there were guys in the gym, juiced to the, uh, to the guild, who were looking for my instruction and following my books and Hard Gainer magazine because they just loved the results. Because with reasonable genetics and drugs, I mean, the Hard Gainer instruction is, whoa, you know, it really, really works. The thing with, with the guys on drugs is because almost any training works for them. You know, they, they tend to go with the high volume, almost everyday training instruction because it works for them. And because that's the mainstream advice, they do it. But the irony is they could probably get even better results on a lesser amount of training if they were to adjust their training so it's you know, more in line with the sort of stuff that we teach. But because those guys don't need to do that, 
generally they don't do it. Um, so that was an aside. Anyway, back to um, back to the, the mid eighties. So I really got thinking about um, using a magazine in nineteen eighty eight. That that was when uh, I um, I really thought, gosh, uh, I think I could do this. And that was when I started uh, hunting out um, uh, contacts and help and uh, finding out how I could get uh, exposure through uh, advertisements that I would um, um, compensate for by providing articles in lieu of the advertising. So I started setting things up in 1988. And this was when I was, uh, I was 29 at the time. I didn't know anything about publishing. I had no background in marketing. I was holding down a full-time job as a school teacher, but I decided that you know, I really wanted to have a go at making a difference instead of just whinging and whining about the, the lack of a decent magazine. So it was a big gamble, it was a commitment. I had to take a loan from the bank to get going. And my office, office in quotation marks, was a desk and a few shelves in my children's bedroom in a two bedroom apartment. So that was how I started. But the gamble paid off. And from 19, 2004, there were 89 issues of uh, Hard Gear in the magazine. And of course, at some point in there, Bob, around about the, I don't know, the, the mid 30s, that's when uh, you came along. I remember, actually, I remember your, your, your initial contact and uh, you sent me photos and you were a man. I mean, man, I mean, your passion, your enthusiasm, it sort of, it sort of just left off the page, you know. I mean, I, I thought, I mean, when I opened your envelope, it was almost like you were in that envelope and you jumped out at me. <laughs> With all, with all your enthusiasm, there's no way that anyone could say no to Bob Whalen. I mean, and your passion was wonderful. And, uh, you know, we sort of a to and fro to begin with, got you going with your first article, and then you were, you were one of the rocks of the magazine. And uh, I, I remain appreciative to this day, Bob, for your help with the magazine because you were an important part of keeping it going. Thanks a lot, Stuart. I, I thank you for getting me my start in writing. Now, even though I, I retired the magazine in uh, 2004, I'm, uh, I'm giving it a, a new lease of life now because even though you know it's, I was 10 years ago, um, the content of Hard Gainer is still every bit as relevant, helpful, and inspiring today as it was when first published. I mean, Hard Gainer magazine isn't a magazine that dates. I mean, Hargana magazine, the content is still current. I mean, with most um, modern magazines, I mean, you, they're magazines that date because they deal with current uh, fashions in food supplements, which are ever-changing. They deal with uh, fashions in uh, the champions, which are ever-changing. They deal with contest results, which are you know, always happening. They, they, they have lots of news, and, and most of the magazine gets dated very quickly. But with Hard Gainer magazine, it simply doesn't. I mean, you can dip into a magazine from back then, and the information is still, in, in most people's eyes, those that haven't read the magazine, the, the information is fresh and motivating and inspiring and, and practical. And I want to bring this, uh, I want to give this a new lease of life, and that's why I, I've started to digitalize the magazine, giving it a new title because it's a, a digitized version. So I'm calling the, the digital hard gainer uh, bodybuilding gold mine because, you know, it's, uh, it is a gold mine literally of, a, of training instruction. And uh, I reckon that there's um, no other publication that's focused so sharply on hard gainers in such detail, uh, with such care, and for so long as Hard Gainer magazine. I mean, it was for 15 years. I mean, it was, you know, focused for 15 years. And that, I think I, I kept to my um, initial remit, you know, of um, tight, uh, focused uh, instruction and, um, and all the rest of it. So I think I kept up with it for 15 years. And uh, the training methods it promotes um, work better. I mean, and not, as, I get, as I said before, they're not just for hard gainers. The instruction works for everyone, but it works for hard gainers too. Uh, where some training instruction, it does work for some people, of course, 
they doesn't work for hard gainers or pretty much anyone who isn't on drugs. But hard gainers, a different story. Now, over the 15 years of hard gainer, the contributors changed over the years, uh, but there was always a wealth of expertise, experience, and enthusiasm. Uh, and the content always remained fresh, inspiring, practical, and useful. So, I produced the first two digital volumes of Hard Gainer under the title, as I said, A Bodybuilding Goldmine. There are five issues of Hard Gainer in each of the volumes. Uh, I've done the first two. Uh, they're available from uh, Amazon and Kindle format. Uh, if people want uh, a sampler or a taste of a magazine uh, for free, they can go to hardgainer.com, uh, sign up for our newsletter, and they will get a 100-page free sample of Hard Gainer magazine. It's actually uh, two of the issues. Each issue is approximately uh, 50 pages. So you can get two free issues digitally on your computer screen just by signing up for the newsletter. So Hard Gainer continues today, but just uh, in a different format. There aren't new print magazines, but there is the new format, the digital format, but for people who prefer the, um, the traditional print format, all the magazines are still available through the post from hardgainer.com. So if you visit the site, uh, you can check out the content uh, of each of the issues and uh, pick uh, the one that uh, you're particularly interested in, uh, and I'll have them sent to you uh, the old-fashioned way. Stuart. We're going to wrap things up, and I just want to thank you so much for the great information. Please visit Stuart's website. It's hardgainer.com. There's a lot of great books there, and also the, the digitized Hard Gainer, like Stuart just said. And Hard Gainer, in my opinion, is the greatest magazine in physical culture history. It was a godsend after Iron Man ended in 1986, and I was so happy to find it. So I just want to thank you again, Stuart, for starting Hard Gainer sign up for the new digitized version of it. The website again is hardgainer.com. That's H-A-R-D-G-A-I-N-E-R.com. And thanks again, Stuart, for being on the show. Uh, you're very welcome, Bob, and thank you very much. It's been uh, great talking with you. Don't be a flamingo, you have to do your squats. Don't be a flamingo, real lifters work their legs. That's going to do it for this edition of Natural Strength Night on MindForceRadio.com. Please bookmark that website, MindForceRadio.com. Bob is always looking for new writers for naturalstrength.com who are old school, hardcore, write with passion and have a strong anti-steroid stance. He also wants your training questions so they can be answered on the show. Please send your articles and training questions to Bob at mindforceradio at earthlink.net. Thanks for listening. See you next time. <laughs>